Stop the Week with Robert Robinson. Hello. Our conversation this evening comes from Sarah Harrison, the novelist, Milton Shulman, drama critic of The Standard, Stephen Oliver, the composer, and Benny Green, the polymath. We have music from Jeremy Nicholas. Now, we were talking about how do you respond to someone who says Mozart's no good last week, and I have a note here from James Fisher, who, well, I don't know if he lives in Berkeley Square, but certainly his firm is in Berkeley Square, and he says um, people who wrote to the great sage of Baltimore... H.L. Mencken, as you will recall, proposing preposterous ideas such as the one you mentioned on your programme last week, now, i.e. Mozart's no good, he simply had a pre-printed postcard which said, you may be right. And uh, as I was saying last week, I couldn't, I have never been able to bring myself to say that. Um, I, I have to admit to anything, but if it were pre-printed, it would indicate that that's just exactly what you were expecting from the correspondent you then sent the printed thing to. So it's a good idea. Now, I have a note from Eric Heyman of London West 4, who always heads his writing paper, as we've observed before, non-Volvo, said Humber. And he says, I've recently returned from Sweden and begged to report many sightings of Volvo Domesticus. However, no Volvo Domesticus flavus, the yellow variety. Do they fly south for the winter? As a field researcher in what he calls the RSVP, the Robinson Study of Volvo Propagation, Mr. Haven should, of course, know that the Volvo flavours suburbans can be found complacently wintering in double carports lining the unadopted roads of Godalming and Isha. But I am reminded that Humbers actually hibernated. As lighting up time grew ever earlier and the long Surrey winter set in, retired bank managers would jack up their Humbers on bricks in garages where a paraffin lamp forever burned. No Humber was ever seen in Hazelmere between Martin Mass and Lady Day. But I abandon the elegiac note now and get back to this week and say this. I realise that for some years I've been unconsciously assuming that God meant newspapers to be tabloid, that even the so-called quality papers were tabloids at heart. And their broadsheet appearance was a sort of pantomime skin inside which two copies of The Sun were trying to pass themselves off as one copy of The Times. It was the appearance this week of the new daily paper, The Independent, which showed me it could be otherwise. Leafing through its refreshingly austere pages on the first morning, I got the distinct impression I was being treated as a grown-up person, something I thought no newspaper would ever dare to do. In its comprehensive refusal to grovel to the readership, the new paper threw into sharp relief the way even the best of its rivals do just that, and, curious effect, priceless to a newspaper. I'd never seen it before that morning, and yet it was as though I'd been a subscriber for years. What do you think of it? Well, I was, on the whole, delighted by it. The first thing I did to try and assess what they were up to was to try and do the crossword, which is always a useful way of assessing what they think is the intelligence of the reader. And the crossword was uh, just difficult enough to make you feel intelligent when you got some of the answers. It was a very satisfactory experiment. That was the first thing. The second thing was some of the letters betrayed the English whimsicality that we used to look for in the Times and now appears to be about to transfer to this new paper, which is a very good thing. I regretted ten pages of City News against two pages of book reviews. I think even a good paper like this one's going to be, obviously, uh, makes too much of the city. I think ten pages against two for literature is daft. Aren't I'm, they going to run, just to, I'm, I'm so, maybe wrong here, aren't they going to run two pages of books and arts every day? Well, they're, gonna run, they're certainly going to run ten pages of the city every day. Well, so well, I don't see why they shouldn't are. run literature. On the other hand, there was a book review by Antonia Byatt, which was a thousand words, which I think is marvellous and commendable. And they didn't try and break up this wadge of print with cartoons and jokes and naked ladies. They had a wadge of print and asked you to read it, which I think is a marvellous thing. I must say, I think that the quality of the feature writing and, and the columnists that they have will only de develop or be seen to be what it is over a long period. But I would say about the actual English 
in the ordinary news reports, it, it's entirely like a clean lens, unhyped up by histrionics or cliché, and you simply saw the story through it at rather longer than usual length. Well, there's a very good piece on Shaw's play, Miss Alliance, an excellent piece, and a very good review of Edmund Wilson's book on the 50s. Those two items alone would justify the paper for me for the whole week. I liked the Miss Alliance review, too. I thought so, that was really told you so about I, put yes. the play in context. I wanted to take up Benny's point about English whimsical. It did seem to me that, uh, and also combined with Bob's idea about you've been uh, feeling you've been reading it for years. Well, in a way you have, you know, because it is an a quintessentially English newspaper to read of James Fenton in the jungle, Terry Waite in the Sudan, the pound falling, and the whopping deal rebuffed is more or less to define English society today. And to join all this with something about child sex must mean that you're reading nothing but an English newspaper. I didn't I read like any the of bits. That. I didn't read any of that. <laughs> Never that, do. That was the front page. Never read it. <laughs> read the paper backwards. It's a sign of a cult of gin. Uh, what, what I liked was the things which I haven't seen in a newspaper before. There was a very good little thing called Second Thoughts, where a writer is permitted some years after his uh, writing a book to talk about it yet again. I, I think this is a wonderful idea. And who, who would not wish to have re read the Second Thoughts of Beethoven on uh, tearing up the dedication of the Eroica or Dryden about the Ode to Cromwell after Charles II had come back? Or even that Times leader, which a hundred years ago said, it is possible to look upon the present with undisguised satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I don't understand a word of any of this because I don't like newspapers as purveyors of news anyway. I can't understand how anyone can have a relationship with a newspaper. And it seems to me that there's something essentially prissy and tight-assed about this much-trumpeted neutrality, which is, after all, in Where itself... Where do you pick those phrases up from those well, tabloids sorry. you read? I yes, think. exactly. Well, so. I, I suspect in common, I know in common with most people who we choose to deplore here, would much rather have, you know, um, swinging, biased comment and scurrilous gossip and pictures of lions with little white mice on their heads and working girls without much on and Fergie coping with a full skirt in a, in a, in a course 10 gale, preferably while receiving a bouquet from a little moppet of under five. And this is what we all look to papers for. Now, oh, no, the thing is, on, now, please, let me go on. What Listen annoys me about this so-called, I quote, neutrality and independence is that it is just a flipping selling point. It is the readers who are going to project their personality onto this newspaper. They are just going in like some plain virtuous girl at a party saying, I don't want to attract all those nasty common sex mad boys. And the fact is that these readers, they're going to be saying in six months time about the independent, oh, it's that paper that's read by all those nitpicking broadcasters. Take it from me. Oh dear, well, I, I did think to myself that who needed my praise in a matter of this sort? Because they <laughs> hope to sell in great numbers. I, I just don't know. But well, Milton, I think that, you're I, the journalist. Yeah, well, I think that's a major problem. Um, has the British public's taste for uh, words really been so um, diluted over the past 30 or 40 years, that a paper like this is going to have a very, very limited chance of success. Public, on the whole, has for decades thought words as unimportant, shared in that prejudice by proprietors who also didn't think words or journalists were very important. So what I like about this paper is that journalists are important. And every tiny little story, no matter how small, has a byline on it. It's the first time I've seen that. Even stories of two or three paragraphs is written by somebody so you can blame them or praise them. I, I go so far with, uh, with Sarah as to say, yes, it does look, doesn't it, as though most people like their newspapers to tend towards the comics that we used to read when we were young. There's been a mad commercial scramble to, as it were, capitalise on that presumed bias. That's why I congratulate this paper, this particular paper, for dealing with I, what, the way I would put it is men and women, not posh men and women. Think how awful it was when the Times said uh, it was read by all the top people. Not posh people, not dons, not nit nitpicking broadcasters. Just people who are ordinarily a man and woman, grown up uh, in that way. Now, I well, conjure up a stereotype. I just want to illustrate yes. the point. I conjure up a stereotype all for each of this paper's three rivals. Um, uh, I see the, the Times still being read, even though it's a different sort of Times, uh, it's still being read by a civil servant of around assistant principal grade, it seems to me. A bearded schoolmaster is reading The Guardian, and a retired dentist is reading The Telegraph. But although the style of this new paper, The Independent, is immediately distinct and alluringly so, no stereotype springs to mind, but a sense of someone reading the paper who doesn't necessarily want his prejudices catered to, who doesn't uh, armour himself in received prejudices, and I, this is the point I'm, I'm coming to. 
the significant thing about this may be that lurking behind those ridiculous stereotypes that I've just evoked, there may be a constituency which is exactly like that, a constituency which has been waiting for the independent. I only say this, cleaving to what Milton has said, I just hope they're there in sufficient numbers. I buy papers so that I can have my prejudices confirmed. Uh, either I want to, the papers to support me or to make me angry because I realize what idiots they are on the other side of these previous arguments. So that when I'm reading the paper, I'm reassured over my cornflakes that life is all right. There are still some sensible people about it. And uh, I can shout at my wife about what total idiots are writing about things that are opposite me. I don't believe that, I think papers have to be in an argument. They can't stand aside from an argument. I think that they, they should be in corners and putting on seconds. Very old-fashioned view, Milton. No, I know. I mean, I, no, I, no one can deny it's always been like that, yeah, just no, as no one that, can deny that in politics that's always the way no, it's no, been, confrontation. I, 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 I think, don't believe, therefore, that it has always been The most so. ineffectual man is a man in a pub brawl who holds the jackets of both fighters. I think this is what the independent is doing. And I think in the long run, that kind of stance encourages intransigence because the both fighters believe that someone out there, some neutral out there, is on their side. Stephen, well, you were hypnotised by I all that Milton was saying. Hypnotized. I was a bit hypnotised because I'm trying to work out. I don't take a newspaper, so it, I'm a really sort of well, what Olympian. What are you doing here, <laughs> I wonder? That's a frightfully you good mean question. No newspaper at all. No, I don't. I don't read a newspaper at all. No, not should. even the Standard. Yes, well, 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 to I give us a, how do you imagine it to be? I mean, do carry on. Well, well, what I mean, what I'm trying to get from what the undertext of what you're all saying is what you what deep emotional satisfaction or mild pleasure you get out of these extraordinary artifacts of man i, I can just see that there's something uh, 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 that you can take your own time in by a newspaper like mrs todger's lodges dodging about among the nice bits with a fork but i don't really <laughs> see whereas the radio is just giving you information all the time but i honestly don't really see the point. That's what I'm trying well, to we'll, say. We'll leave yes, you there really in your, the in really your unregenerate state. No, we'll ask Sarah to say something. But Benny, oh, ah. hold on. No, no, Benny no, sounds no. absolutely astonished. No, I don't. I don't. No, I, don't. I, I was just coming to that. We, 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 we have to ask Stephen, you know, how does he fill his time? And I suppose he fills his time watching EastEnders or Coronation Street. He fills his time composing operas, you fool. I know he does operas. It takes a hell of a lot of time to compose operas, you know. I don't suppose he gets up and composes them over porridge in the morning. I mean, they're period of time <laughs> when presumably he's not composing uh, something uh, uh, and <laughs> the issue is why I uh, I get seven newspapers every morning good and Heaven. six on weekends so but uh, you're unemployed <laughs> virtually except <laughs> until the evening when you go to the theater critic. no no to me this is EastEnders this is Coronation Street because I have to have the minutia of each thing I'm reading about shown to me every day I watch every day what Reagan and Gorbachev are going to do from data. If, I, if I miss this by two or three weeks, then the story is broken. Milton, just as, if I, if I miss the East Enders, <laughs> I wouldn't know what the characters were going to do. Similarly, I have 10 or 15 coronation streets every day that I watch. And this is what is exciting and fills my time. Now I know what the trouble is. <laughs> now, now he's told us. I've been searching for years, Stephen, for somebody else uh, who doesn't take a newspaper oh. because. Uh, I, want, I want to tell you a brief anecdote, which is quite true, about my father, who also didn't take newspapers, <laughs> and it got me into trouble when I was about eight. Our teacher at school wanted to find out the political complexions of our class. And there were 31 of us in the class, and she said, hands up all those boys and girls whose mummies and daddies read the Daily Herald. And they got 15 hands up, and then she said, hands up all the boys and girls whose mummies and daddies read the Daily Express. And 15 put their hands up and she said, Green, you haven't voted. And I said, my father takes the racing on football outlook. And it was true, but I ran into trouble because she didn't believe me. Well, now, you're the first person since I've met. Sure, but what we haven't not. considered most is the magical. Oh, most saying. people do take news. The British, people, the British are the most read, addicted to newspapers in the yeah, world. I mean, if you want sweeping generalizations, come here, I say. <laughs> yeah, clearly every, that. Every week and you get them. But <laughs> consider about tabloids and, and uh, broadsheets, as they're called, when papers like like the Express and, oh, what was it, the Mail and the Sun, which you remember had once been the Daily Herald and was a whacking big broadsheet and the Sun began life as a broadsheet. When they shrank themselves from the one into the other into the tabloid, 
I found I simply felt, well, they're just doing the rational, sort of sensible, technical thing. It's easier to hang on to, it's easier to read. But I wonder if there's something in these two shapes that isn't so easily rationalised. Isn't there something about a broadsheet that's part of the image of a grown-up man, such as you notice when you were a child, someone sitting uh, by the side of the fire, opposite someone else, with his telegraph at full stretch and pronouncing? And isn't there something about the actual shape of the tab? Tabloid, technically much more feasible uh, to hold and to read. Something about it that's too jolly close to the sort of comics we all read when we were children. Very, ever finally to be taken seriously. Very, very seriously. seriously. That would be the end of the Economist. The New Statesman, The Spectator, which New are York tiny books. Books. Yes, so I can't New be all books. bad. In <laughs> fact, yes. the more I think of it... No one calls I... me the greatest straight man in the business <laughs> for nothing, Milton. <laughs> the greatest thing about a is you can hide behind it. Yes, true. Yes, yes true. you have to tussle with it. You have to sort of... You see people felding it madly in trains to get to the little nugget that they want. But don't you think that there's something very... It's just social behaviour, is it? It's just crawling under your duvet at the beginning of the day as well as the end of it. It isn't just that. That is... Is part of it. There's also a function of informing that comes uh, very much uh, second. You see, clearly, even, even clearly not. Ah, there uh, you go. Radio and television are infinitely better in virtually every way. The, the, and, and you would know because you don't read newspapers. The television. Well, you're, television you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're doing this entirely this untrammeled this by is, fact. This is, this is, this is Robinson's it. law again. We've already <laughs> had it once. Tele this evening. Uh, yeah. Sarah, 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 Sarah. Can I just say that I just just to be a little bit more serious for a moment. Well, that, 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 a, that a paper that comes forward and says that it is going to give you this independent, lucid, um, sort of plain man's view of everything, and we're going to be treated like grown-ups, isn't there a serious danger that it's going to rob us of that wonderful scepticism that we bring to reading newspapers? I think one of the good things about newspaper readers is that they go around saying to each other, well, you mustn't believe everything you read in the papers. Won't this whiter-than-white, greyer-than-grey publication actually rob us of that? Much more important than that, I think, is, is what, 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 what Sarah was saying about, about bias. I absolutely agree read them, one of the most vicious things in this newspaper is this irritating habit they've picked up from the Sundays of having these brief things in my own profession of brief definitions of artistic endeavours, uh, one-liners. There is now a, a production of Twelfth Night, which I have seen advertised in the Independent as, uh, here is a production of uh, Shakespeare's most coherent problem comedy. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't even have the incidental merit of truth. You know, you're, you're, you're frightened me. You know, do, do you vote? Yes. How do you make a decision? I uh, live in the world. Oh, I see. And what do you see around you? You're a tiny little world in London. It's quite in the a big world. world. Do I live in London? No, I... yeah, where, wherever you live, I'm sure that your views are not I have, likely. To I be have social relationships with people. In the North by you... unemployment in the South or whatever. <laughs> no, that we, well, we, we don't. Know, he does what not exist. We cannot get to in do with that. Well, I would like to sum it up. I think there are some papers, and quite a lot of them, and Sarah's been really describing them. When you open them up, you find yourself reflected in their pages as some sort of, what shall I say, punter or consumer whose prejudices and appetites are coarsely predicted and pandered to. I say this about the new paper. It seems to treat you as an equal. Now we're going to have a song. That song is called, for reasons which may appear, The Usherette's Blues. I work at the Palace Cinema As an usherette, you know And I've been tearing tickets there For fifty years or so Showing people to their seats And selling the ice creams The Palace is a wonderland of fantasy and dreams I get to see the films for free but it drives me round the bend because I am an usherette I never see the end Did Gary Cooper get the girl or what? Did Judy Garland find her dog? Were Robert Redford and Paul Newman shot? Did Snow White turn into a frog? I don't know if the Phantom shows his face Or if they captured Orson Welles Did Charlton Heston win the chariot race? 
Did they let Charles Lawton keep his bells? I'd love to know what happened to King Kong And whether Bonnie married Clyde Did Julie Andrews sing another song? And was Kirk Douglas crucified? Did Mrs. Danvers die in Mandalay? Did Edward G. beat Steve McQueen? Did Cary Grant get hitched to Doris Day? I've missed the end of every film I've seen. And Scarlet ever live at Tara? Did Ingrid Bergman marry Rick? I missed the last part of a bridge too far. A star is born and Moby Dick. What happened at the end of Rocky Jaws? Born free and chariots of fire. Never know who won Star Wars. Next week I'm going to retire. Well, now, there, there, that was about the usherette who never got to see the end of the film. Uh, but who knows? Just now and again, she might be awfully lucky not staying till the end, not seeing the end. But I I'm, I'm wonder what it is that everyone enjoys about really bad films. Uh, it doesn't make sense, really, to enjoy bad films. Good ones are what you're paying to see. But when a film is exactly bad, not just vaguely no good, but inspirationally bad, you do find yourself very pleased indeed. How delighted I was at the press show in 1959 of Solomon and Sheba, one of those epics they don't make anymore when the temple had tumbled down on Gina Lola Brigida. She'd been stoned by disaffected extras dressed in tablecloths. There was a fearful thunderstorm going on and God's voice was rumbling out of the clouds, whereupon the high priest, played, I'm almost sure, by Raymond Massey, raised his eyes to the heavens and gloomily muttered, it's been a hard day for all of us. <laughs> now, making anthologies of bad films has become become a cottage industry over the last few years and Solomon and Sheba I'm glad to say is included though not that particular quote in the latest installment of the Golden Turkey Awards they also have such imperishable lines as that unloaded by Anne Baxter as Nefertiti to Charlton Heston as Moses he's not the shape for Moses anyway not the way I imagine Moses in the Ten Commandments Oh, Moses, Moses, you stubborn, splendid, adorable fool. Well, that's hard to beat, isn't it? <laughs> the thing is that the, not only is the book funny, but the categories are funny. I mean, they have a category, the worst Ronald Reagan movie ever made, which is very funny in itself. But they omit a thing I saw of his called Bedtime with Bonzo, <laughs> in which the, ex, the, the future president of the United States co-starred with the monkey. <laughs> and uh, I don't know whether it was accidental or vicious, but uh, it just so happened that soon after Mr. Reagan became elected president of the United States, uh, the film suddenly appeared on BBC <laughs> Two one afternoon and nearly undermined the special relationship. But, I mean, that's omitted from this book, which gives you an idea of what some of his other pictures yeah, are like. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's some badness which is really endearing. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a film that commends a plague of frogs to us all with, with the words, I can't get over it, Today the Pond... Tomorrow the world. <laughs> and it has all the terror, doesn't it, of my little pony. But really it's the lunges after fine writing, as, 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 as Bob mentions, as a wonderful, there's a desperate lunge after the rhetoric of the Book of Ruth, you know, whither thou goest I will go, and all that, which, which runs, the headman's locust bean cakes will be your <laughs> locust bean cakes, and his fermented buffalo milk will be your fermented buffalo <laughs> milk. Yeah, I think, I, I think uh, the idiotic ad lines are very funny, because Oh, well, yes, I, yeah, yeah. I've never read uh, Variety and seen uh, these ads. I, I thought, uh, when you're six tons and they call you killer, it's hard to make friends. It's a uh, film, Namu the Killer Whale. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
They went in people and came out hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> the corpse grinders. <laughs> so, uh, but there was a there's a lovely conversation in a thing called the Night Monster. Navy nurse, how did that tree get here? <laughs> Meteorologist in plain English, it walked here. Nurse, it's hard to imagine carnivorous trees that move on their own roots. Meteorologist, not carnivorous, omnivorous, all devouring. He'll eat anything, even other trees. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I absolutely agree with Stephen. He says some of them are quite, in, quite endearing because a really bad film does have a kind of innocence. I mean, there's this chap, George Barrows, who's self-assembled and we're sure how knitted gorilla suit won in 300 roles in films. And when they wanted a robot gorilla, they simply put a diving helmet on him and there he was on some beach or other. The really unpleasant ones are the cynical ones. It seems to me that In Search of Historic Jesus, which was a kind of pseudo-documentary, is, is unpleasant and pernicious. And under this heading, I must mention two notable omissions from the most insufferable kiddie movies. One is Care Bears, the movie. Now, I don't know whether you chaps have managed to catch that, but it makes Mary Poppins look like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And just when you thought your gorge could rise no higher, along comes the aforementioned My Little Pony, the movie. And this is a hippophobe's nightmare <laughs> in which horrid little candy-coloured nags, and listen to this, gentlemen, in baby doll pyjamas and teensy polka-dotted tennis outfits, actually continue to wage the awful war against grown-up sensibilities and you just wish that one of those pony club mums would come along with a great big crop you know no one, say get into that muddy no, ditch no one who's ever been a film critic ha ha has failed to collect his own sort of uh, grimoire of, of examples like that one of my fav favorites is an early clint eastwood film i've forgotten the title uh, and all the verismo was lost right at the beginning, at least for me, because if you look closely, there was no doubt about it. Clint was suffering from a cold. His <laughs> nose was red. Well, you could do it. But when you got a slight look, it was from time to time just weeping, just <laughs> running. In the same... in the same, I mean, you could imagine someone saying, reach for your mouchoir, that kind of thing. It is the lack of dignity in in, uh, in dialogue, which is just, just as yeah, you said there. I remember a film about Mozart in which Mrs. Mozart said, said to him, Wolfie, he said, she said, this apartment is the pits. And it's, I don't it's just you not right. Can, I, can no, I tell you? But another I one in, in Phantom of the Opera, the silent <laughs> film, a card comes up to the stage and says, I, well, I am the Phantom of the Opera, but when I was a man, men called me Eric. <laughs> somehow, somehow that word itself takes away... Can I tell you? Yes, <laughs> well, the business of musicians, the, the biopics about musicians oh, are wonderful. The, I saw one when I was a film reviewer, and it was about Beethoven. And you see Beethoven, it's in one of his poverty uh, passages of his life, and he's living in, 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 in the, on top of this inn. And he hasn't paid his rent for a long time, and he's upstairs trying to compose at the piano. And the innkeeper decides that the time has come to get some money off him. So he goes upstairs and he says, Mr. Beethoven. And, and, and you see Beethoven sort of trying to write. And he says, Mr. Beethoven. And there's no answer, so the innkeeper thumps on the door and he goes, <laughs> And Beethoven says, My God! And starts with, Da 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 da. And when I saw that, I resigned from the job. Well, I saw a film called Angelique, and it contains one of the best of bad lines, immortal lines, really. I think you'll enjoy this wine, Pomerol, 1620. <laughs> <laughs> but my all-time favourite, I think I must have referred to it before, is the one where at um, <clears throat> combined miniature deterrent forces, yes, they're briefing Stephen Boyd, uh, prior to shrinking him to microbe size along with a submarine and a crew and injecting him into the circulatory system of a scientist who's got a blood clot on the brain and oh, a, yes, a, a marvellous right. secret to give mankind and they're supposed to dissolve this blood clot and well says Boyd as though he didn't want anyone to think he hadn't had his leg pulled before that's a wild one and then he pauses <laughs> for sober reflection about three seconds and then it's up anchors and away and wonderful lines in it Raquel Welch, I'm delighted to say, was with us there. I never dreamed it could be like this, she said, you know, going up the carotid what's name. <laughs> Physicist and paramour she was. Donald Pleasance was saying, and this is so true, we're in the carotid artery. <laughs> Damn it, it should be the jugular vein. <laughs> and then outside, while it's all going on, one general, you know the, how they had, used to have generals who were fairly scientific in some of these movies. One general said to another, how long can we stop the heart for? And the other whips out his slide, room and, slide rule and consults it very shrewdly and then says, 
as short a time as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Very scientific ben, response. Ben, ben Great film. That, I'd love to see it again. <laughs> the lyrics are, are one of the best sort of purveyors of badness in films. Oh, yes. and there's a wonderful one quoted here. Which, Pippa's world is fun, diddle 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 dee. Pippa is unique. She is such an imp. You will love her too, which <laughs> nearly equals my favourite lyric of all times, which was sent to me in a libretto, purporting to tell the story of Hamlet's parents' wedding. And Gertrude sang this immortal couplet. This is Gertrude singing, We will laugh and we will play on our lovely wedding day. <laughs> well, you know, there's one, there's one. Can I just quote this quickly, Milton? This, it, it quoted in the book. You may live by me today, then tomorrow go away. There will be no tears from me. That's the way it's got to be. That's sort of a thing called the horror of Party Beach. I just <laughs> throw that in as an example well, you know, I, I, of the decadence I, of Western society. If we get society. serious for a second, um, I don't think a real test of a bad film is how ludicrous the plot is or how preposterous the dialogue. To me, the test of a bad film is how boring it is. I and mean, if I am really bored, uh, uh, then I really have seen a very, very bad film. Because if it's ludicrous enough, I'm enjoying myself. I'm rolling in the aisle and uh, having a marvelous time. And the uh, uh, watching I friend spiders the size of skyscrapers or hearing Alan Ladd say, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. You know that's the kind of film that you like. But Cecil B. DeMille's epic, The Ten Commandments, was for me the most boring, excruciating. Well, it had, unfortunately, it had an interval in it. And trying to get back after two hours, it went on for three hours and 45 minutes, something like that. After two hours, was the most painful experience of my life, making up a decision to go back to see it. I had to do it because I was working. Well, who was it shouted out in the premiere, let my people go? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody yeah. really Somebody, did. Yes, I, yeah, and, and you know, it, it, it sounded as if Exodus had been rewritten for <laughs> a publication by Mills and Boone. And, and after it was all over, you know, one began to understand what it felt like, you know, the Jews felt like, from wandering in the wilderness, I think, for 40 years. <laughs> You always felt that those biblical films, I do agree, you always felt that those huge polystyrene building mm. blocks which, which, which were, of which the temples were made were sort of crazing and disintegrating under the onslaught of the musical score, didn't you? But it, but it gives you, you I'll just, I just slide this in. I mean, we've all been laughing at these films and we'll continue to do so. It's really giving us a holiday from the authentic, isn't it? I mean, that's the charm of it. We're freed of responsibilities. Our sensitivities aren't going to be tested. tested. It's really, when it's as bad as Milton's been described, it's so bad, all of us are easily going to be better than it, as it were. Sarah was talking about uh, religious films before, and there's one about the, in this book from the great story ever told, where James says to Jesus, what's your name? Yes. And he says, Jesus. And, and he says, yeah, that's a good name. And, Je <laughs> and Jesus says, thank you. And I'm going to advise, I mean, I, I once wrote a review uh, of um, a film called The Agony and the Ecstasy. Um, I, really, I think it was Mel Ferrer who played Michelangelo. Yeah, I can't was, swear to it. It's, it's coming gone. to you, Stephen. But it was one of those... They don't make them anymore. And all I did, by way of the review, was to copy out the dialogue. I put the word rhubarb, rhubarb in between, and I advise our producer now to fade out whenever he thinks he's had enough of it. Uh, it went as follows, rhubarb, rhubarb, rhubarb. What's still at it, Michelangelo? <laughs> I have much work to do. Come into the chapel. As you know, it was built by my uncle, Pope Sixtus. That is why it is called the Sistine Chapel. You will decorate it with appropriate designs. Rhubarb, rhubarb. I shall go to Constantinople, but this is madness. <laughs> These days, we all walk on the sharp edge of a sword. Sarah Harrison, Stephen Oliver, Benny Green and Milton Shulman were stopping the week with Robert Robinson. Jeremy Nicholas provided the musical interlude and the programme was produced by Michael Ember.